Okay, time in for the recording. Welcome back. We are the Lum Rim Practice Module Class 5. Class 5. On June 15th, 2023. Let's gather our minds here, please, as we usually do. Bring your attention to your breath until you hear from me again. Now bring to mind that being who for you is a manifestation of ultimate love, ultimate compassion, ultimate wisdom. And see them there with you. They are gazing at you with their unconditional love for you. Smiling at you with their holy great compassion. Their wisdom radiates from them. That beautiful golden glow encompassing you in its light. And then we hear them say, bring to mind someone you know who's hurting in some way. Think about how much you would like to be able to help them. And how the worldly ways we try seem to go on to fall short. <laughs> Sorry. How wonderful it would be if we could also help them in some deep and ultimate <laughs> way, <laughs> I'm sorry, a way through which they will go on to stop their distress forever. We are learning how that is possible.
And even if it's just still a hope in your mind, I invite you to grow that wish that you can someday help them stop their suffering forever. Grow that wish into a longing. And with that longing, turn your mind again to that precious holy being there before you. We know that they know what we need to know, what we need to learn, what we need to do to become one who can help that other in this deep and ultimate way. And so we ask them, please, please teach us that. And they are so happy that we've asked, of course they agree. Our gratitude arises. We want to offer them something exquisite. And so we think of the perfect world they are teaching us how to create. We imagine we can hold it in our hands and we offer it to them, following it with our promise to practice what they teach us using our refuge prayer. Here is the great earth filled with fragrant incense and covered with a blanket of flowers, the great mountain, four lands, Wearing the jewel of the sun and the moon. In my mind, I make them the paradise of a Buddha and offer it all to you. By this deed, may every living being experience a pure world. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Tayami. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the highest community. Through the merit that I do in sharing this class and the rest, may I reach Buddhahood for the sake of every living being. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the highest community. Through the merit that I do in sharing this class and the rest, may we all reach Buddhahood for the sake of every living being. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the highest community through the merit that I do in sharing this class and the rest, may all beings reach their total awakening for the sake of every other. So let's do our practice preliminaries first. So bring your attention back to your breath. Use it as a time to teach yourself the different parts of you that are learning to meditate that it's time to go inward. Focusing on your breath can become a trigger for that. Mm. It seems like a simple task to just focus on our breath.
We'll learn how to know when to shift into the meditation. We'll learn later another course. But when we shift, we shift intentionally. So intentionally shift your object of focus again to that precious being before you. Think of who they are for you and those good qualities that they embody. Think of just one of those good qualities that inspires your heart. Think of a way in which seeing that good quality in them has already helped you in some way. and feel your gratitude towards them. And your devotion to learn more from them. And mentally honor them for that good quality that they must have worked hard to uh, create or how they've used it to help you. We call it a mental prostration. See them smile in understanding of what you're trying to convey. And from your gratitude, make them an offering. Some beautiful thing that represents your feelings towards them. But also, Offer them the explanation of some way in which you put into practice something you learned from them. They already know it about you, but they're so happy to hear you recognize you taught me to go out of my way to be kind to something, somebody I I don't like so much, and I did it this morning. They love that kind of offering. Again, see them so happy with you. And you feel so safe in their presence that you open yourself up to admit some unkindness. Tell them about that. Feel your regret. We have all kinds of excuses for why we were nasty in that way. And none of those excuses matter right now. What matters is our recognition that we planted seeds within our heart that when they ripen will bring us more of the same the unpleasantness and the habit of reacting unkindly. And we don't want it in there. So 
So we tell them, we are, tell them we're sorry we made that mistake. Make a promise to not make that mistake again in some specific instance and time frame. And as your antidote, perhaps say, I will listen carefully in this class to find one nugget of your amazing wisdom that I can use later today into tomorrow to show that I'm catching on to what you're teaching me. And again, see them so happy with you. And they remind you to next add rejoicing. Think of some kindness you saw someone else do in your world. Tell them. Tell them of another goodness you yourself have done. And find a third one to tell them about. My Lama says, Stay on this preliminary, preliminary until you find yourself smiling. So let's just smile so we can go on. We ask them again to please stay with us, stay close. We ask them to continue to teach and guide and inspire. We ask that those people around us who help us and uplift us stay close. We ask that we ourselves are better able Mm. to see teachings coming to us by way of our everyday experiences in life. And finally, we dedicate the goodness that we've just done so far. Hmm and some specific thing that you would like to see in yourself or your world in the next week or so. Good, now for our class purposes, leave your precious being out there in front of you they are using me to communicate with you. And bring yourself back to this room, your room, back to class. Take a stretch, get refreshed, feel ready to receive from them.
And then let's listen again to the verses of the text that we are studying from. This recipe for our ultimate love, ultimate compassion, ultimate wisdom being. So translators, you're welcome to go ahead. You don't have to wait for me to go verse by verse, okay? The source of all my good is my kind Lama, my Lord. Bless me first to see that taking myself to you in the proper way is the very root of the path. And grant me then to serve and follow you with all my strength and reverence. Bless me first to realize that the excellent life of leisure I have found just this once is ever so hard to find and ever so valuable. Grant me then to wish and never stop to wish that I could take its essence night and day. My body and the life in it are as fleeting as the bubbles in the sea froth of a wave. Bless me first thus to recall the death that will destroy me soon and help me find sure knowledge that after I have died, the things I have done, the white or black, and what these deeds will bring to me follow always close behind as certain as my shadow. Grant me then ever to be careful to stop the slightest wrong of many wrongs we do and try to carry out instead each and every good of the many that we may. Bless me to perceive all that's wrong with the seemingly good things of this life. I can never get enough of them. They cannot be trusted. They are the door to every pain I have. Grant me then to strive instead for the happiness of freedom. Grant that these pure thoughts may lead me to be watchful and to recall what I should be doing. Grant me to give the greatest care to make the vows of morality the essence of my practice. They are the root of the Buddha's teachings. I have slipped and fallen into the sea of the suffering life. Bless me to see that every living being, every one my own mother, has fallen in too. Grant me then to practice the highest wish for enlightenment, to take upon myself the task of freeing them all. Bless me to see clearly that the wish itself is not enough. For if I am not well trained in the three moralities, I cannot become a Buddha. Grant me then a fierce resolve to master the vows for children of the victors. Grant that I may quickly gain the path where quietude and insight join together. One which quiets my mind from being distracted to wrong objects the other which analyzes the perfect meaning in the correct way. Grant that once I have practiced well the paths shared and become a vessel that is worthy, I enter with perfect ease the way of the diamond, highest of all ways, holiest door to come inside for the fortunate and good. Bless me to know with genuine certainty that when I have entered thus, the cause that gives me both the attainments is keeping my pledges and vows most pure. Grant that I may always keep them, even at the cost of my life. Bless me next to realize the crucial points of both the stages, the essence of the secret ways. Grant me then to practice as the Holy One has spoken putting all my efforts in and never leaving off the practice of the four times highest that there is. Bless me, grant me, that the spiritual guide who shows me this good road 
and all my true companions in this quest live long and fruitful lives. Bless and grant me that the rain of obstacles, the things within me and outside me that could stop me now, stop and end forever. In all my lives, may I never live apart from my perfect lamas. May I bask in the glory of the Dharma. May I fulfill perfectly every good quality of every level and path and reach then quickly the place where I become myself, the one who holds the diamond. So I hope those verses are starting to have some familiarity and some uh, attraction. Last class, uh, we, we learned more about the Bodhisattva room, that level of the prayer where we've said, oh, all beings are suffering. I, if I can help myself, which we haven't got quite there yet, but if I can help myself, I, I, they can all do it too. I want, I want to be, I want to help. I want to help them all. And just wanting to do it isn't enough, we learned. It's the start. But then to actually make that change in ourselves, we declare that we will by taking our bodhisattva vows and the Bodhisattva vows instruct us on in how to live according to the six perfections. The first four being those activities that help us grow the last two, which help our first four be done with greater wisdom, which helps grow the last two, right? And we see this beautiful circle upward spiral, preparing us, preparing us, preparing us. And at some point, our precious holy guide says, you are ready. And you get to choose whether you agree, whether you're ready to go on. You don't have to. Technically, the Lama waits for you to ask. But we still need to be ready. And they then escort us into that crystal initiation room and help us move on through the swifter path. But that swifter path isn't swifter if we don't have all the goodness that we've gathered from diligent effort on the earlier path. They say the lower path, but it's not lower at all. So how did we get to cracking our, our heart open to wanting to be the one who can help every being free their suffering, we must have gotten some kind of glimpse of that the end of suffering is possible. And some sense of confidence that we could learn how to do so. And some verification of that confidence by way of how we have worked at changing our own behavior sufficiently to actually see some kind of result, some kind of change in ourselves, some kind of change in the people around us, some kind of change in our environment. This path, wants us 
to try things on for size until we see till we receive evidence. So, so we reached the Bodhisattva room by way of managing to get through that mirror room, the karma room, which we had spoke a little bit about, but I'd like to go into in some greater detail. And then in this class, I'm hoping to also get to the room before that. And then we have plenty of time for the, how, anyway. So if you recall this particular room, uh, is, a, is a room full of glass figurines, big ones, little ones, many, many, many of them. And they're sitting on mirror shelves in a mirror room mirror walls, mirror floor, mirror ceiling. So imagine you're, you've you just opened the door into this room going forward and you're looking in. Imagine it's your first time. You, you, you see yourself looking in like zillions of you, right? And you see all these glass things and there's light bouncing off all of them. And it's like, at first you can't make out what's what. And I don't know, I think like my first glimpse into it would probably be, you know, I, I can't go in there. But we're gonna step in anyway. And it's so packed with these glass things that you can barely move without knocking something over, you know, breaking it. And then you try to pick it up and you bend over to pick it up and you knock over three more things, you know. <laughs> and the task in this room is to learn uh, and practice how to move through all these fragile things of our lives, mm, gaining the skill to find yourself moving through a beautiful antique shop, gazing and admiring and taking care of, right? These precious, precious objects, not wanting any of them, but wanting them all to stay beautiful and intact and available to others as we move our way through this room in this graceful, enjoyable, safe, confident way. And when we are able, when we find ourselves in that state of mind, most of the time, let's say, that's when we recognize I learned how to do that. When I first entered this room, I couldn't think without breaking something. But now, right, I've learned. And now I really enjoy this room. And I see that if I could do it, Others could do it. And in fact, I want others to do it because of how much happier and confident and peaceful I feel in my life. I want that for them. And that's what brings us to the Bodhisattva room. Right? So we want to understand what's what's our training like in this mirrored room we may spend a long long time working through this room and 
it's it's not good or bad to spend a long time. In fact, I would argue it's good. The longer we spend in this room, the swifter will be the remainder of the rooms because this room is our karma room. So karma, we tend to hear the word karma and immediately think, oh, the law of cause and effect. And it is that, but when we learn the details in this tradition, they define karma as lele jita nuts, okay. Uh, no, that's not the definition, that's the explanation. Lay, it means movement of the mind and what it motivates. That sounds very different than the law of cause and effect, doesn't it? Because it's very much more personalized. It's movement of my mind and what it makes me do. Is your mind ever not moving? No. You know, even in sleep, technically, awareness is still doing something different instant by instant. And that very movement is what we mean by karma. So karma is not making it move. Karma is this process of movement of the mind. Our, our awareness shifts. And we have a different subject, object, interaction going on. And then it shifts again. And then it shifts again. And with each shift, we have this process of me, other, interaction. And as long as that process is misunderstood, we have the experience of me here, of them there, each in, in ourselves, and then what they, what I experience, I experience as them doing that to me. Even if it's your car driving you to the grocery store, you're the driver, but there's something about the car that's doing it to you, right? It's driving you. And that means if the car doesn't work, to get me there, I blame the car or I blame the guy who crashed into my car, right? Or I blame the tire company for not making better tires, right? I blame somebody for what I experience. Technically, even when I experience something pleasant, I blame the other for my pleasance. We don't call that blame, do we? Because blame, we only blame when it's bad. Otherwise, good, you know, please be, give me pleasure, right? But we're still misunderstanding. So karma means when my mind moves and it instantly responds, technically reacts and that reaction has within it me versus other and that naturally has in it protect me serve me okay me me is the most important and that colors my choice of interacting with the other and the instant we are aware of ourselves finishing our interaction towards the other, which technically we finish every instant, but let's just say finish, right? That perception that we've had has made an imprint on our consciousness, on our mind. 
And that imprint stays being influenced by other imprints in and other imprints out until something happens that that one has reached enough power to cross the threshold into manifestation. And we experience a situation similar to it, only, only they say bigger. It can't be identical because it's been influenced by the time between when it was planted and when it ripened. It's influenced by things that are similar adding to it and things that are dissimilar taking away from it. So if we have negative imprints of, let's say, being angry and yelling at someone, future anger, future yelling adds power to previous angry yelling seeds. Anytime we are in a situation where we would be inclined to yell out of anger and we don't, we've, we've negated a little bit of power from all our previous angry yelling seeds. So you can see it becomes a numbers game. If we could know, you know, I have 90,000 angry yelling seeds in me and I only need to then do 90,000 not angry yelling seeds to make no more yelling seeds in me altogether, right? We could just tick them off, one, two, three. In which case we might actually put ourselves into situations of wanting to yell back to be able to tick it off, right? Now, I'm not saying you should do that because it's hard to hold that mindset strongly enough to actually be successful, right? I'm not gonna yell and then, bah, there it goes, we do it. But I want you to get the idea of how this isn't about judgment i'm good i'm bad they're bad they're good it's it's so it's clearly about what i see myself imprint into my mind is gonna come back to me eventually similarly do i like to be yelled at from angry people no well then don't make it that's the only place it comes from. And our minds go, no, that's not true. They're a jerk, right? Duh, duh, duh. They, they drink too much. They, we have every reason in the world why it's not my lay, my movement in the mind and what it motivates, making me be in this situation of them yelling at me angry. Are they angry and are they yelling and are they a jerk? Yes. It's real, but how we respond to them creates more of that experience or less of it. And you decide what you want. Maybe you like being yelled at by angry people, in which case, fine, create as much as you want. But when you decide you don't like it anymore, you're the only one who can make it stop. Do you like kind people when you're upset listening without telling you what to do? Yeah. Do we just listen to people and not try to solve their problems for them unless they ask? Yeah, we tend not to, right? Oh yeah, I see you're really suffering. You know, this is what you should do. Right? We use that word. You should blah blah blah. And when somebody says you should to me, there's something in me that goes, "Right? Don't you tell me what to do." 
right? I admit it. So I try to be careful. There are other ways. Anyway, the whole idea is that this mirror room, it's intended to be like disorienting when we first step into it because we are dealing with moment by moment interactions that are happening so swiftly, we aren't really even aware of their subtleties. Each, each imprint that gets made, it includes the obvious, but it also includes anything else you were thinking at the time, like it includes what the weather was like at the time, the time of year, like everything. Yeah, you know, some of you have heard my example. Does anyone have a pen? I have a pen. Oh, bing, thank you. This one has made this imprint of providing, providing a need for someone. We would say giving a pen. But really, this one solved a problem. This one provided for a need. And this one, if it was aware that it was windy outside, then the imprint includes that. Every imprint includes every part, gross and subtle. And it's, you know, we don't have to worry about that when we're working with it. But understanding that everything is included, we see how our work with karma gets much more and more subtle than just, am I going to yell back or not? It's like, am I going to not yell back motivated by, like, I want to stop my suffering? Am I going to not yell back motivated to help them? Stop yelling. Am I motivated to influence my coworker? Okay. Our, what's on our mind as we're doing that deed is included in the imprint. And we want to train ourselves to use that to our advantage. Oh, not ultimately. As our practice grows, we want to have the idea of emptiness and dependent origination on my, in our minds as we're doing our deeds. And I don't know why that's so hard, but it seems to be. No, we can think of it. I tend to think of it, you know, 10 minutes later. Oh, I should have done that with bodhicitta in mind, you know, but that's the practice. And this, this room, is indicating that at first it seems overwhelming and every movement of my mind is breaking something because every movement of my mind is so ignorant. I want tea. I want more sleep. I thinking those things are going to bring me the happiness I want or get rid of the distress that I have. And it's just perpetuating the cycle by even thinking those things, all right? Now, don't get down on yourself because that's all driven by seeds too. And so we can stop it. We can change it. It just isn't gonna happen magically. We have to work at it. So as we are moving ourselves through this mirror room, the way we work with it is we think of some of these figure, figurines are those, those situations in life that are your button pushers. The things that trigger your distresses and mental upsets and unhappinesses. You, you're, these like nondescript figurines start to take an actual recognizable shape. Oh, there's that jerk at work. And I'm going to learn. Like he's on every shelf somewhere. And I'm going to learn to move through this room 
recognizing him, recognizing that he's going to do something to push my button, being prepared for it, and having already planned out a different response to what I ordinarily want to do towards that jerk. Why? Because I want to stop breaking figurines. Another why, in doing so, I'll stop having jerks that push my button because I will stop having that button. If I don't have that button anymore, that guy can be the same jerk and it won't upset me because my button is not there. There'll be a different button probably, but we can change that guy at work. Maybe he becomes your best coworker and you don't understand why did I think he was a jerk? You know, the love story movies are all like that, right? The rom-coms, you jerk, I don't want anything to do with you. And then they fall in love. So same idea. I just wish that the movies always had us, had the two people working on it karmically instead of, you know, magically. Anyway. So let's get a little bit more specific about what behaviors am I on guard to avoid and what behaviors do I want to be training myself to do instead if what I see myself do in response to my every experience is where I have the power to create my future. I want to know how to create a nice future for everybody. It's fair to say, I want a nice future for me because then we're motivated enough to learn how to do it. And along the way, we recognize, oh, the way I am more successful in learning how to do it is to help other people do it right once we get that it's like let me into that bodhisattva room please but we're we're still working on ourselves in the same way as if the bodhisattva room is full of the glass figurines too don't do that in the meditation but we can see how it's not like we ever completely leave the mirror room even all the way to our Buddha, me in the courtyard in the center is still living, existing by under the truth of mer mer merit ripening into appearing nature and the emptiness that allows that to happen. Buddhas need to perpetuate their Buddhahood. And they do so through this same process. So while we're training in this glass room to just stop breaking things, we are in fact training in becoming fully enlightened beings someday. And you don't even have to know it, right? It's not sneaky. It's just that's the evolution of the consciousness is to get there eventually. So there are many different levels of behavioral discipline that we can and will talk about through the course of the ACI Foundation courses. Mm. The basis of all of them is called the 10 non-virtues, avoiding the 10 non-virtues. And those 10, they are not unique to the Buddhist tradition. They are the common 10 that I think we would come up with ourselves if we had enough time to think about it. And remember that when we say the behaviors to avoid, it's not because these 
enlightened beings decrete it, it's because these enlightened beings recognize all the mistakes that they made in the course of their own suffering lives through which they learned how to behave differently that brought them to that reality of being manifestations of ultimate love, ultimate compassion, ultimate wisdom. So they give us this guidelines of behavior in hopes that we don't have to reinvent the wheel to save us time and suffering. It's up to us to choose to work with them or not. And that precious being who loves you so much will not abandon you or stop loving you if you hear these 10 non-virtues and say, eh, those are not for me, right? They are so infinitely patient with you. It's like you and your teenage son, right? They get harder to love maybe, but you don't love them less. It just hurt, twists your heart, you know? when they go on to make the mistakes that you try to say, if you do this, that will happen. And they go, I don't believe. And then, you know, when they're 40, they finally come to you. Gosh, I wish I'd listened to you, they say. Right? <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't, I'm not a parent. I don't know, but somehow past life experience, right? Shows it. Mm, we're like that. Think of some part of you as being the teenage kid rebelling against parent who's just wanting to help, okay? These guidelines wanna help. So here they are. There's three of body, four of speech, and three of mind. The three of body is to avoid killing others to avoid stealing from others, to avoid sexual misconduct amongst others. Now, you know, we'll talk further about what that all really means, but the bottom line is when we kill, we get the imprint in our mind of having taken a life. So technically we've stolen as well. And then that imprint, when it ripens, what's it gonna be like? Somebody killing me. Will that be a pleasant experience? Probably not. Maybe so, but probably not. And that's why to avoid killing others is because being killed is unpleasant. And being killed in the process of being killed, our habit is going to be, I will kill you before you can kill me. Which means we've just circled the wheel of suffering, stealing the same thing. If we steal, we will be stolen from. We won't have the things we need because we took them from someone else. We won't have trustworthy partners because we weren't trustworthy partners or our partner, we influenced our partner to be untrustworthy to their partner. And, you know, we're talking about intimate relationship here, but it reflects in other relationships as well. Then the four of speech, avoiding lying because it's unpleasant to be lied to. Avoiding harsh speech, you know, meaning cursing, swear, swearing, yelling, screaming, being unpleasant with your speech divisive speech, which means speaking in a way that pull, pulls people apart. 
So pointing out, you know, other people's negative qualities to other people makes the other people like them less. If it's a top 10, we must do it. Uh, useless speech. Long story about useless speech. The three of mind. The words are coveting, ill will, and wrong view. Coveting means I want what you have. But this imprint is being unhappy when someone else gets a little bit of happiness. Whether it's something they got that I wanted or not doesn't matter. It's just that twinge of, I don't like it that they got that. We could call it jealousy or envy. It all falls under this coveting thing. Then ill will, at the biggest factor, it's like you wish something bad happens to somebody. I mean, that's obvious ill will. But it's still ill will when we're aware of something unpleasant happening to somebody else and we just don't care. You know, we're not wishing bad on them, but we're just their problem, not mine, is a level of ill will. And then wrong view, we've come to use the term wrong view to mean not aware that everything is seeds ripening and nothing but, but that's really highest, highest, highest wrong view. Wrong view here means just at the level of not being convinced that my actions now uh, create some effect in my future. Um, when we try to work that out, we'll reach a point at which we think, well, the system can't work if we're talking about just this one lifetime. And so if we don't believe that there are past and future lifetimes, uh, it's harder to understand how our actions and consequences really run our reality. So a part of this wrong view is not understanding that there's a you that goes on and has come from before, that this you's lifetime is one small part of. And that when we get this greater awareness, then our concern for our movement of the mind and what it motivates goes beyond our concern for this life. It goes into what happens next and after that and after that and after that. And there's a piece of that shift from just me now and my needs to this bigger picture that helps us make this shift from wrong view to right view. There's another piece of this level of wrong view and that is not having a understanding that there are fully awakened beings already existing. Right? The term, they, they say to not believe that there are Buddhas. So this wrong view is not just ignorance. And we address it as we learn the ACI. And, and we come to see, we'll be aware that when that shifts for us, that wrong view, and then we can work with it deeper. All right? So as I said, these... Oh, sorry. Time for a break. Past time for a break. Let's take a break.
Are we back already? <clears throat> So avoiding these 10 non-behaviors is half of what we train ourselves in, in this mirror room of working with our karma. The other half is to train ourselves in their opposite. So we could call them the 10 virtues. And they're so fun to talk about. We it, we could go on for days about what does it mean? The opposite. I will avoid killing. Is the opposite just not killing? Or is the opposite actively protecting life? And it's not really an and or, right? It's all of the above. And do we only protect life when we slam on the brakes because the squirrel's running across the road? Or do we protect life when we wear our seatbelt and insist that our passenger wear the seatbelt? So we kind of think, well, I have only rare opportunities to protect life. But in fact, we can find in our day many opportunities to recognize that we are protecting life. Often, more often than we recognize. So we're training ourselves to very intentionally avoid killing by very intentionally being one who protects life, right? If our mind is focused on protecting life, 
we're not going to be as likely to inadvertently or advertently kill somebody. So not killing the opposite is protect life. Not stealing the opposite is protect others' property. Yeah, I can steal. That's enough. But when I borrow the neighbor's, you know, lawnmower, I return it after I'm done. But I could clean it up and oil it and return it to him in better shape than I used it. And I would be protecting property. Uh, protecting others' relationships, really honoring others' friendships, others' close partnerships, uh, behaving around others' personal partners as if your partner is there with you, right? Their partner is there with them. So you're not the least bit tempted to flirt or nudge or anything, right? In order, to create a world where people are trustworthy. You know? Partnerships are trustworthy. Speech, we speak truthfully, not giving wrong impressions. It doesn't mean to say to the your girlfriend, you shouldn't wear that color. It looks awful on you, <laughs> right? That would be speaking truthfully, but it's unkind. So truthful does not give you heart launch to be unkind. Mm -hmm. um, harsh, harsh means speaking sweetly, gently, kindly, right? We don't like harsh sounds. We don't like harsh environments. Don't be harsh with our speech. <clears throat> Useless. I speak purposefully or not at all. That one's probably the hardest, to be honest with you. Coveting, the opposite of coveting, we could say, is being happy when others get the things they want, especially if there are things that you want but you don't have, especially if they're somebody you don't like, right? That's hard to be happy when someone you don't like gets some kind of pleasure, and it's a really powerful time to be happy. The opposite of ill will is caring and wanting to help another who's having a problem of any kind, especially when you don't like them, right? Willingness to help someone who's having a problem easy to do when it's somebody we love or like, harder to do when it's somebody we don't like, even harder to do when it's somebody who's hurt us in some way. But that's where we push the envelope of our doing the opposite of ill will. So again, in the course of the ACI training, we learn how these past non-virtue seeds, how we can recognize them ripening in our experiences. And so know that our natural ignorant response to those situations would replant negativity and we would be better able to choose our response by recognizing the opposite behavior according to the virtue that we are, the non-virtue we are experiencing ripening. There are many details on how to do that. <clears throat> and as we train in that, our ease with which we can move through the glass figure room 
right? Shifts from, yeah, this is an awful, scary, dangerous place to, wow, what a beautiful antique shop. So how did we get there? The willingness to step into that disorienting, you know, crazy, difficult room. We had to gain some level of motivation of wanting to avoid something to make us willing to take on this practice that is hard work. So there's a hallway that comes before our mirror room. And this hallway, it has glass windows in it. And when you enter this hallway from front towards the mirror room, outside those first two windows, like on either side, you, you look out there and you see yourself, maybe one window is yourself in the past and the other window is yourself in the future. And you see yourself in some situation that caused you um, great distress or pain or upset in your past. You know, we've all got at least one that sticks in our memory. They did that to me. I got so hurt, so upset. And you see it happening. Maybe it was physical pain. Maybe it was emotional pain. And look out the other window and see some difficulty you might expect in your future. Some obvious, unpleasant something happening. Not that it's going to, but just, you know, something that happens to humans. That's called obvious suffering. Obvious suffering is all of those distresses that we experience in the moment, something unpleasant, headaches, backaches, fired from a job that you liked, untrustworthy partner, just plain obvious unpleasantnesses are called obvious suffering. There's another level of suffering Buddha taught and it's called the suffering of change. The suffering of change is harder to recognize and actually happens more often to most humans than obvious suffering. Obvious suffering is someone who has chronic pain, chronic mental illness, chronic emotional distress, meaning they have it all the time, or someone whose circumstances is that they're struggling for survival. They're in obvious distress most of the time. But those of us in more for fortunate circumstances, our obvious suffering, you know, comes from time to time. Headaches, toothaches. Can't get what we need. The suffering of change means that when something pleasant is being experienced and that pleasantness ends, the ending of the pleasantness because of our misunderstanding of where the pleasantness really came from triggers a desire for more of that thing that's now gone. And that wanting more of the thing that was pleasurable that that's now gone, believing that having more of it will bring me the pleasure back again is what they mean by this suffering of change. David and I call it the, the suffering of and then it's gone. 
You know, you only get ice cream once a week. Finally, it's time for your bowl of ice cream. And it comes down to the last bite. And then it's gone for a whole nother week. And that, and then it's gone, is a suffering. We don't even recognize, we take it so for granted that that's what it is to be human. But it even happens to me in the morning, I wake up, I want more sleep. Sleep time is gone, I want more sleep. And I, force myself to go to the exercise class I lead. I have fun while I'm doing it. And then it's over. Just when I'm getting warmed up and having fun, it's done. And by the time it comes around, I don't want to go again. <laughs> like, what's up with that? Suffering of change is like happening a lot once we recognize it. But we could come to the wrong conclusion and say, oh, Buddha is saying, don't enjoy anything. Don't want anything. Pretend nothing's pleasant and you won't have the suffering of change. And that's not the right conclusion. The reason we have the suffering of change is because we misunderstand where the pleasure is coming from. We're so convinced the pleasure is in the ice cream that of course when the ice cream's gone, the pleasure is gone. But what did they call it? The something alert, right? Spoiler alert. The pleasure is not in the ice cream. We could create our movement of the mind and what it motivates to be pleasure, 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 just pleasure. And if we think of it, uh, we, we should aspire to that. But if we reach it, still steeped with our like self-cherishing me, we will go in the wrong direction in seeking that pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And even if we have the seeds to get a glimpse of it, we will use it in the wrong way and we will lose it. Whereas when we create it in a wisdom way, we create pleasure that we automatically and spontaneously perpetuate. And it's hard to even conceive of. Buddha you in Buddha paradise emanating will experience bliss, wisdom constantly. Like omniscient, always the maximum bliss but always again, or more. Like how can you have more bliss if you're already as blissed as possible? And it's like, yeah, we'll all know when we're Buddhas, right? Every perception is bliss because it's unrelated to the perception. Your state of mind of happy or not happy is unrelated to what's going on in the moment. And that is so hard to live according to until we create the seeds to live according to, right? And then we'll be forced to live according to that. And how much easier it would be to interact with our world in a kind way if we are not thinking my state of happiness or distress is related to what's going on around me. If my state of happiness is not related to what's going on around me, I can be in a state of happiness all the time. And with that state of happiness, interact with er anyone, everyone, in a way that I hope helps them reach that too. So if we don't recognize 
our suffering of change, it won't occur to us that it's in fact a suffering, pleasurable experiences ignorantly experienced are in fact a suffering. So that we wanna fix it, so that pleasurable things are not suffering, so that nothing's suffering. So those second windows, you'll want to picture something happening outside those windows that reminds you of this, how pleasurable things wearing out are misunderstood. And so they are in fact a suffering, but not something to avoid, but something to learn how to use to perpetuate the pleasure for everyone. The third kind of suffering is called pervasive suffering. It has many levels. At this level, pervasive suffering is the fact that every instant of this life is being used up by experiencing it. And so by being conceived, this pervasive suffering started and we are using up our seeds for this life, this health, this particular kind of awareness, human awareness. And so by being conceived, our ignorant mind is already uh, in the process of experiencing aging, illness, death, and forced rebirth. And that underlying suffering is even more ubiquitous than the suffering of change. And it's subtle, this one. As we train our practice, we'll see how this pervasive suffering uh, is actually a bigger category than just what I spoke of and how it becomes actually not so hidden, right? Pervasive suffering actually can be quite obvious. So why are we talking about suffering in preparation for going into that mirror room, because we, when we get to a point where all of that suffering is just, we, you know, we finally have had it up to here, something happens finally that it occurs to us that, that there just has to be something broken here. Some, there has to be something wrong with this picture. It can't really be that this is what it needs to be like for infinity. Right? Some, something triggers a wake up call. And I don't know what it will be or was for you, I know what it was for me and I remember it so clearly and it pushed me right onto this path that I didn't know that I wasn't aware of I didn't know I was interested in and it's like there's been no going back how swiftly things have happened since that event that just shifted my reality you know, from material reality is truth because you can see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, feel it, to, well, that's not true. You no, know, in a in a matter of minutes. And I had nothing to fall back on. And so I was in this vacuum, right? This black hole. And fortunately, I had enough goodness 
that that black hole sucked uh, some wisdom beings to me, to teach me. You know, and then, I don't know, in 30 short years, no, 40 short years, here I am with something to share, right? Something to give. So the verses that we're on, it's it's a, uh, what we've been talking about is held within several verses. But when you work with it, you'll see how they go. The, the mirror room, Geshela likes to relate to the verse that says, grant that these pure thoughts may lead me to be watchful and to recall what I should be doing. Grant me to give the greatest care to make the vows of morality, the essence of my practice. They are the root of the Buddha's teachings. The verse before that ties in to the mirror room. Bless me to perceive all the wrong, all that's wrong with the seemingly good things of this life. I can never get enough of them. They cannot be trusted. They are the door to every pain I have. Grant me then to strive instead for the happiness of freedom. So this verse is the hallway that leads us to wanting so strongly to learn to change our behavior that happens in the mirror room. It's saying, I don't need to grow the wish to avoid obvious suffering because I already want to do that. But to come to recognize that seemingly good things of life still make me suffer because I they leave me wanting for more. And I have this constant dissatisfaction. And it it doesn't matter what I do. I just keep trying for more happiness and it all goes wrong. It all, I get it and it ends. Or I don't get it and I'm upset. Either way. It's not working. Without coming to that, our own conclusion. We'll hear these teachings and they're fascinating and interesting, but when we get to the glass room, we'll just stand there. So this hallway is important, not just to scare ourselves. And I mean, I mean not to scare ourselves at all, but to come to recognize that th this, is, this is the nature of the human realm. Obvious suffering, the suffering of change and pervasive suffering. And we all have the goodness to have a, a glimmer of how it's all unnecessary. All of that suffering is a big mistake. And it could be brought to an end. Nobody else can do it for us. Our teachers can teach us, but it's up to us, the teenagers, to decide, am I going to try what they say? Or am I going to prove it? You no. Know, am I going to wait until it occurs to me? Totally up to you how much time you want to spend in this hallway of the three sufferings before you decide, I've had it, I wanna break out of here. All right, Geshla says, we need to recognize we're in jail before we'll wanna get out of jail. So this hallway, you could think of it that way too, recognizing there's bars on those windows or bars on the door, let me out of here. Right? until the door swings open. And then you're standing there with all that glass and mirror staring you in the face. 
right? We want to get to that point where the hallway has shown us the true nature of our suffering so clearly that we're willing to step into the confusion of that mirror room and take it on as a challenge. You see the connection? In practice, don't push yourself so fast. It's about renunciation, which we'll learn about in ACI 1. Being in this hallway room, it's about growing our renunciation. And that happens on our first path, the path of accumulation. So let's walk our way through these two rooms in a guided visualization. And then depending on how long it takes me, we'll quickly go through the rest of them, right? So we'll call upon your familiarity with the other rooms. But let's explore these first two, the hallway and then the mirror room into Bodhisattva room, okay? So stretch and wiggle and have something to drink so that you can settle in. I set your body upright, but well propped so that you're comfortable and relaxed. Let your physical you sink down <clears throat> and your wisdom you rise. Not out, just rising. Start your focus of attention turning inward by starting at your breath. Counting out and in as one breath. Try to focus really alert and fascinated on those sensations for five breaths. Now find yourself at the entry inside the entry door to this hallway with windows on either side. Take it all in and then look to your left out that closest window. See you in some experience of obvious suffering. I see me there with one of my wicked migraines.
feel you're feeling, oh, I remember how awful that was. I wish I could make that stop for her. I wish I could make it stop. Why does that have to keep happening? Surely there's some way to stop that. Then turn and look out the right window opposite. See a future you in some kind of office, some kind of obvious pain. And it's easy to arise the feeling, oh man, I want to prevent that from happening. If I really knew that was coming, I'd be willing to do something different now. And step a few steps forward, look to the left again. And see something there that shows you the suffering of change. Maybe you recall, now that you've heard of the suffering of change, you recall some situation that was so pleasant that when it ended, you were so disappointed. But recall at the time that despite that disappointment, we just carried on. We didn't doubt whether the pleasure really came from that event. Our disappointment spurred us to go looking for something else to give us pleasure. We want to recognize that sense of displeasure that comes when the pleasure stops. So then look out the right side window and see a future you, but like next week future. Enjoying something pleasurable and then it wears out. And the you watching watches as ignorant you again feels Disappointed feels left with wanting for more and that sense of how do I get it, wanting something else. 
and the you that's witnessing this. Hmm. Now that you know a little bit about the suffering of change, can you witness and feel a sense of compassion and th this is unnecessary, this kind of suffering. I didn't even know it was a suffering. Now I do, and it's unacceptable. I'm getting a glimpse that my state of mind of happiness or not doesn't have to be related to what's going on at the moment. I'm beginning to feel this sense of wanting to stop the cycle, wanting to do what's necessary to change this mess. Obvious suffering is obvious, something I don't want. But if pleasurable things are suffering too, this is broken. I want to fix it. And then you step a little forward. Look back through the left window. See something that reminds you of pervasive suffering. This one's harder. The fact that we are using up this life moment by moment No matter how much yoga we do or vegetables we eat. In a worldly way, there's nothing we can do. In our old way of manipulating things to stop this pervasive suffering. But it too is part of the great mistake. It does not have to be. Our own determination to stop recreating obvious suffering, the suffering of change and pervasive suffering is the start of our ability to make that change. How much suffering do I still need to undergo before my wish to stop it gets strong enough for me to be willing to change my behavior? In our use of this meditation, you can walk back and forth in this hallway, seeing various scenes outside those windows, each time feeling your reaction to what you see, watching for when that reaction is finally enough. I've had enough. I'm taking responsibility for my own suffering.
And when you reach that, have something in that window on the right there by the exit door that confirms that I am ready to take responsibility to change my responses to both unpleasant things and pleasant things so that I can stop this big mistake of pervasive suffering. And so I imagine that you in that hallway has gotten this deep aha. And because of that, that door to the mirror room swings open. And you're standing there looking in. So many yous looking back at you. All the light bouncing around. All the glass figurines everywhere. If you feel a sense of overwhelm, that's good. But stand your ground. Your teacher is there with you. They can't make you go through into that room. But they are there by your side. Sort of invisible at this, well, no, not. They're there by your side. And so muster some confidence to try. and step into that mirror room ever so carefully. And think to yourself right now, what's my biggest day-to-day -day challenge? And see that challenge as a particular figurine shape. And now that you have a specific figurine shape in mind, now as you look through the room, you see, oh, there it is. Oh, there's another one. Ah, another one. You can start to delineate that particular figurine from the mix of the others. And get a sense of that figurine and what it represents in terms of those 10 non-virtues. Oh man, I respond with ill will. I see that now. And give yourself an idea of how you might choose to respond with the opposite of ill, Ill which is helpfulness. How could I be even a little bit helpful when I'm feeling like that other person deserves what they're getting, represented by that figurine? And you'll see that when you have this plan, your ability to move through your figurines gets a little smoother, a little easier. So maybe on any given meditation day, you just move an inch or two in this room 
without knocking over glass things. Or maybe you work with just that one situation and see yourself able to, although you knock over others, that one you keep intact. How you use this room is completely up to you. So now let's say you've used this room over a period of time to train yourself in recognizing your ignorant reaction to situations both pleasant and unpleasant. And you've trained yourself to respond with wisdom instead. And so now, by the time you are two thirds of the way through the room, the path through the room is easy and clear. You're enjoying the objects. You can even handle them with no destruction of them. And you're moving through with such ease and such happiness that it occurs to you, if I can change this much, and now I know what worked for me, I want to help everybody do it. I want my loved ones to know how to do this. And we find ourselves reaching that blue door of the Bodhisattva room that has its list of guidelines for how to become the one who can help that other. And there's a picture on that door that reminds you not just your loved ones, but all others. And when you have that added peace, that blue door opens and you're in the room of the six perfections. I'm gonna go fast because we only have two minutes. Giving, moral discipline, not getting angry, joyous effort, meditative concentration, turned on to the diamond wisdom, that we repeat that, all those deeds, until our teacher there says, ah, you are a vessel that is worthy. And they open that red door to the initiation room. Those special things happen. You receive your implements and vows. You enter into the vows hallway, learning them, training yourself in them. That moves you into the creation stage room where your world looks ordinary at first. You're doing your practice, both on and off the cushion. And those same beings are looking quite extraordinary. And so you step into the four times hallway preparing your hmm, body and mind to do the work, which leads you to the completion stage room, the twisted plumbing, the special teacher, the guidelines, the meditation, where you see that plumbing becoming untied, parallel, merging 
and bringing you to those double doors that when they swing open, you see in the center of that courtyard that fully enlightened you. Exquisite, shining in light, shining in love, shining in wisdom. And in the next instant, you are them. And in the next instant, you are emanating as everything to everyone at the same time as in your paradise. And may it be so. So leave a part of you there and bring the rest of you back to awareness of your body in your seat, in your room, in this time. Think of the goodness that we've just done. Be happy. Offer it to that precious holy guide. Ask them to stay with you, to continue to teach you and guide you and inspire you. They accept your offering and they carry it with them right back into your heart. See them there, feel them there. That love, that compassion, that wisdom. It feels so good we want to keep it forever and so we share it. By the power of the goodness that we've just done, may all beings complete the collection of merit and wisdom and thus gain the two ultimate bodies that merit and wisdom may. So use those three long exhales, share this goodness with that one person. Share it with everyone you love. Share it with every existing being everywhere and anywhere. See them all filled with this wisdom. They don't know where it comes from and it doesn't matter as long as they have it. And may it be so. All right, thank you so much. Please forgive me for going four minutes over. Mm. Thank you to teacher Charani. Yes. Thank you for your precious teaching. Thank you, Victor. Mm. Thank you, teacher. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. So please make these rooms personal to you. Okay. Yeah. Good. So we'll have some more. We'll see you on Monday. Good night, good luck. Love you. Love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.